Christmas concerts, which have been jointly organized by our membership department and the musical instruments department, uh, with support from the Strelson Foundation. I'm Bradley Strauschen, one of the curators of the musical instruments department here at the Net, and it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight and to say a few words about what you're about to hear. So I hope that you are all in the mood for a bit of time travel tonight, because you will meet one of the most extraordinary time travelers in the world of musical instruments, and that is the violin. When you go downstairs and visit our galleries, which I hope you all will, we have one of the earliest violins to survive, which is made by Andrea Amati around about 1557. And when you look at this instrument, you will see that by the 1550s, the violin had already taken on the form that we know, and that indeed today, musicians in orchestras like the New York Philharmonic would give their eye teeth to be able to play an Andrea Amati instrument or a Stradivari instrument. And stop and think about this for a moment, because it's really exceptional. If you think about all the other orchestral instruments um, and what their lives were like during the 1550s, the horn was still largely outdoors in the forest hunting. The clarinet had yet another 200 years before it would be invented. Uh, instruments like the oboe and the flute were instruments with two or three keys. The only instrument that could join the modern orchestra uh, from this whole batch of instruments in the 1500s is the violin. And of course, over the centuries, to keep pace with the orchestra becoming louder, with the demand for instruments to be able to play more notes and to be able to play with greater evenness of tone, some very subtle modifications have taken place. But this is where our time travel comes in. There are two instruments in the Metz collection that are particularly well suited for taking this, us on this journey. And these are two instruments by Stradivari, 1693 and 1694. One of them is one of the very few Stradivari violins that is configured in what we would call Baroque setup. That is, it's set up the way we think more or less it might have been when it left Stradivari's workshop. The two things that you'll notice at a glance is that it doesn't have a chin rest, and that it has gut strings. You can flip over the back of your program if you're interested in more of the subtleties of the, of the way the violin has been subtly modified over the centuries to play in a modern orchestra. So you'll get to hear Baroque configured Strad, Strad set up for modern playing, and also we have a very special guest instrument with us tonight, and this is a violin from the Amati dynasty, this one made by the brothers Amati that uh, Peter Shepard Scarbett has been working with for the last several years, uh, and it's from the collection of the Royal Academy of Music. So Peter is absolutely the perfect person to bring all of these things to life because he himself is an amazing time traveler both in terms of, of the performance projects that he's done. Not only is, is he deeply immersed in the world of historic instruments, museums, and performance, but he is also the commissioner of some 400 modern works for the violin. And having worked with Peter for many years in London before I came to the Met, it's just a great privilege and a pleasure to be able to introduce him tonight. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. 
I noticed a number of you looking at your programmes to work out what that was. And to, make, <laughs> to make things worse, that's not on the programme. <laughs> um, what I love about an environment like this is the chance to share music in a salon environment. That means I'm not sure what's going to happen. And don't worry, most of the pieces in front of you are no more than two or three minutes long, and you're not going to hear all of them. <laughs> what you just heard was the opening of the fifth partie, or partita, by Johann Josef Wilsmeyer, who was an Austrian, um, probably a pupil of Bieber, and it's from his set of pieces called Artificiosus Conchentus Pro Camera. And I'll get into why the violin was standing in a particular way later, because some of you will notice there was something odd going on there. But now I'm going to get into the main business this evening and change instruments. <laughs> With the exception of the two pieces that um, uh, by living composers I'm going to play, nothing you're going to hear tonight was written after these instruments were made. All the pieces that, and that's worth remembering, Strat Stradivarius was a mature maker by the year time the Bach was born in 1685. So that's kind of amazing, and we, most violinists don't spend that much time in the repertoire prior to 1700. So, in order to kind of begin our journey, I want us to jump uh, into the 1650s in London. Um, and I want to put together um, some sh three very short pieces. Everything we're going to hear tonight is for violin alone. I don't use the word unaccompanied. We don't talk about unaccompanied piano, so I don't <laughs> know why you would. And I'm going to play um, uh, an uh, Alamand and Division by, uh, uh, and then followed by uh, Sarabanda, by uh, a violinist called Balthazar, Thomas Balthazar, and followed that, in, in, as, uh, in, in, prior to that, um, a piece, the only piece of solo violin by our greatest British composer, one of the few um, Brits I can honestly be proud of, um, <laughs> Henry Purcell. Um, I'm going to play these on this instrument, the 1629 Brothers of Arti. Um, so just to introduce Balthazar to you, um, Balthazar only lived from 1630 to 1663, and like many violinists, he um, fell prey to the Dean Drake. Um, <laughs> Pepys wrote, he played to the wonder of all the auditory and exercising his fingers and instruments several ways to the utmost of his powers. The Professor Wilson, the greatest judge of music did stoop down to Balthazar's feet to see whether he had a hoof. That is, <laughs> to see whether or not he was a devil or not, because he acted beyond the parts of men. So, first of all, um, the little Purcell prelude, and then straight from that into the little kind of conjoined pieces of um, Balthazar.
So, so this is the this is the this is the wonderful um, Gould violin in Baroque setup, and you'll notice if you look, if I hold the neck up, it's wonderfully fat, and it's also flat to the body. Now, this is more than a supposition of how a Stradivarius instrument was set up, because it's based on the only surviving um, tenor Stradivarius we have, the um, Medici tenor, which is, is set up just like, just like this. Um, I don't want to say yet, I don't want to give you ideas about the sound, but because, because I want you all to do what we all do, which is just to enjoy what an instrument does. And a lot of the music from the 17th century, and this is going to sound a little strange, it simply explores the instrument. So what I'm going to play now is a pair of pieces. <coughs> One is a prelude by Nicola Matteis, followed by something which, which I think will work well, well with it, is uh, a wonderfully miserable jig by Antonio Mantonari, who was a Roman violinist. Um, it, there's something wonderfully um, alluring about the sort of sexy melancholy of 17th century music. And it's, it, once you've started to do it, it, it you, you can't stop it. Um, um, Matthes was a Neapolitan, and he was John Evelyn's favorite violinist. Um, who talked about his performance as being most exquisite, a, a, a miraculous violinist. He just referred to Balthazar as Lubica, the violinist from Lubeck. Um, uh, and uh, Matthias came to the UK from Naples and became a superstar, um, retired several times, and when he, after he died, letters were published in London papers reporting to be from his ghost, warning people not to play his music in environments where there was copious amounts of alcohol being consumed. <laughs> so, this, so, so this will be the Fantasia by my Matthes, followed by the Giga. So almost don't think of it in terms of music, just in terms of, of sound. Thank you. 
So just to point out a really prosaic thing, there is no metal on this instrument anywhere, which means that the gut of the, 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 of the strings is, is somewhere more dominant. So we have, we have sheet gut and we have wood and we have different kinds. And for me, what's wonderful about it, it means that the texture of the music is very close to the texture of the instrument. There's something, uh, there's a certain quiddity about that, which I find very exciting. But let's stay with instruments not being quite what we think they are. So I'm moving back to what we call the modern setup. Yes, with the violin, of course, the word modern is an interesting misnomer because what you're talking about, as well as an instrument which, which fundamentally the design was done by 1600, also the modern setup is pretty much brought to a kind of apogee around about um, 1820. Metal strings were being used much earlier than people think. The only fundamental change in the design of the bow, for instance, since 1790, is the addition of a leather thumb band, which you really don't need to know about. Um, <laughs> but it's worth remembering that until the 18th century, the violin was not set in all kinds of other ways, which is, we tend to think of G, D, A, E as being the strings. But that would be been an alien to the composer until Bach's generation. And I'm going to play you a couple of very short movements of, like the first piece I played on this modern set-up instrument, tuned G, D, A, D. Now we use the word scordatura, which most musicians, for some reason, seems to mean means detuned. It doesn't. That would be discordatura. Scordatura just means tuned, because until quite recently, you, you would, it was how you chose to play the instrument. So you're, one of the things is amazing about this is, well, if I just do this, Tuning the instrument like that gives it a certain kind of spice. And later I'll turn, take this instrument to a normal tuning and then back to a more extreme tuning so you can hear this. I'm going to play three short movements from an astonishing set of 150 works for solo scorpitura by an anonymous composer. Um, this is from the Klagenfurt Handscript, which was a 1685 anonymous handscript found in a nunnery in Slovenia. Um, which should give you a clue as who probably wrote it. And so <laughs> I'm very serious about this, and uh, that I think that what you have here is a piece of music by a nun whose confessor naturally wouldn't allow her to write her name on the manuscript. And this is some of the most personal music I know. So I'm going to play you a prelude, a salabanda, and a, a kind of, well, I don't know what to describe the last one. She has a good title on it. Um, it, it does find its way. So. This is from the Clark and Ford Handscript, just three movements played on Scoratura G D A D. Thank <laughs> you. 
A word about those. You may have noticed. This is not good. You may have noticed that what I'm playing on is rather short. This is very typical for a bow which had been used in about 1680, 1690. It's a copy of the kind of bow which Bieber would use, and I'd like to say it's made by the wonderful Achetier Antonina Renti of Genoa, who is, this is actually pretty close to the favorite musical instrument that I own, this little thing here. Um, so, um, back to the kind of traveling Brits. I'm gonna play you a little prelude by a Yorkshire violinist, about who we know almost nothing, Henry Eccles. He perhaps was the brother of John Eccles, who's known better. We know that he traveled in France, and he also um, dedicated pieces to a number of the French who were involved in a number of financial scams around the Mississippi. <laughs> um, so he didn't make terribly good choices. Um, but by 1720, he was a member of Louis Cannes' Dan Catherine on the 420 violins of the king imitated in the UK by, as the 4 and 20 blackbirds baked in a pie. They're violinists. So this is Henry Eccles' prelude, a uh, little A minor um, prelude back on the original set of Stradivari. Um, I'd like to very briefly find my way into the 21st century. Um, and here's the first of two pieces by living composers. This is a tiny, tiny, literally, it's called Five Fragments. Now, Michael Hirsch, some of you may know, is notorious for writing enormous pieces of music. But two weeks ago, my pianist and I played a piece of his called Session Leben und Todd, which is for violin and piano, and is 90 minutes long. Um, <laughs> Well, one thing I wanted to draw a comparison between the 17th century and our own time is this sense of emotion and touch being very close to the surface. Very, very, um, uh, that the music and the and poetry and the arts have a job to express things very, very directly. So this is literally five tiny fragments of the way that Michael speaks and thinks, and it isn't always comfortable. So they don't have titles, and there's nothing more to say about it. <laughs>
got out of order. <laughs> so let's actually do the experiment now. So here's the here's the stranded modern setup in this tuning. I'll take it up to conventional tuning for the next. Tiny preludes by two musicians who knew each other. Um, one of them is the German violinist uh, Gottfried Finger, who um, first appears as part of James II's Kapelle in London. And like a number of musicians who made the, the bad decision to be in James II's employ, he had to um, find uh, go into basically go become a freelance musician. And one of his colleagues um, in James's orchestra was the extraordinary violinist Ambrogio Lonati. Um, Lonati was um, Milanese and he was uh, in Naples and knew Matthias well. It was probably Matthias who encouraged him to come to London, um, where he joined James's orchestra. And his entire life was marked by scandal. He was involved in, the, in Rome in the stabbing of Stradella. And um, also seems to be implicated in the murder of the uh, violinist Sefaci, um, not violinist singer Sefaci. Um, however, he's also remarkable because in the 1670s in Rome, he was the leader of Queen Christina of Sweden's orchestra. Um, to me, this, I mean, think who she knew. Well, what's amazing about this period is that musicians and artists and philosophers and thinkers were so close to each other. After all, it was Queen Christina who was responsible for killing Descartes by making him get to her up too early in the morning and giving him a cold. Um, so I, I find that very exciting. So two credits, one in E major by Gustavine Finger and the other one by Ambrogio Lamatti.
Sorry about the mess. Um, uh, I'd like to talk about bows. So I've already introduced the, the very early, late 17th century bow. And here's what we call a modern bow. But it, as, as I said, the design of this bow was finalized pretty much by 1790, apart from, well, a certain quirk of the design underneath the frog and this thumb band here, which appears for the first time in the 1920s. So you can see the difference here. One is, is convex and one is concave. And the kind of in the middle is what I was just using. And so that's an early 18th century bow. And not to put too fine a point on it, they get longer. And not just that, the most important thing is this has about 80 hairs, this one has about 120, and this one has 300. So you've got more, it's more to do with how the hair grabs and pulls the string. And there are losses and gains. This, as you heard, this tiny little bow can turn on a dime. <laughs> Which is wonderful. So that's a little bit of more nerdy stuff. <laughs> so back to the question of tuning. And I've found and which is, I'm going to take the um, uh, modern setup strand and take it to uh, another tune. time G string, now A string is going to complain about that for a little while, I can tell. We just won't find music. There we go. So we're going to go back to Thomas Balthazar. And um, this, this is a tuning of A, E, A, C sharp, which means that when you play what's in front of you is not what you hear. What's in front of you is where you put the fingers on the string, which is an interesting mental um, game to play, but of course it's something which lutenists deal with the whole time. So I'm going to play just a pair, uh, uh, a pair of Allemands by Thomas Balthazar, the devilish violinist I introduced earlier.
One of the most... One of the most fascinating things about um, composers is how do they deal with the past? Now, Nicola Lefanu, who's one of the great composers living in the UK today, wrote this piece for me this year because she wanted me to be excited about a carving by the great um, 17th century woodcarver Grimm and Gibbons. And this carving it lives in Fairfax House in York and was made in York before Grinlings came and made, Gibbons came and made his fortune in London when um, he was working up there. <coughs> if I tell you what's in the, on the panel, he will tell you what's going on in the piece. At the front of the panel is King David, who's playing the harp, and he's lost in ecstasy. All around him are dancing cherubs and angels, and there's a most wonderful orchestra playing sackbuts and large, um, large tenors and a funny little violin. And at the back of the ensemble, not looking demurely away from her instrument like she normally is, there's St. Cecilia. And she's sat up there like a prog rock organist, kind of hair streaming back like this. It's amazing, it's very clear who's in charge. <laughs> the, the carving is based on a painting by a Pindar. And in the painting, as in the carving, there is carved a setting of Psalm 150, the most musical of all the psalms by Orlando de Lasso. Of course, it's from centuries earlier than um, Gibbons, but not of Pindar. This is not the normal setting of Lasso's because Lasso's clearly was concerned that Pindar should not have to have an incomplete piece in his painting. So he wrote in this special one and a half minute long setting of the song to go in the painting, which then found its way into the carving a century later which then the Lassus II finds its way, along with all the characters, into Nicholas' piece, which was premiered alongside the carving three weeks ago, and then Sweden a week later, and then London in a Wren church last week, and now it's come to New York. So I, I really, really love it. So this is yeah, um, uh, the great thing. Bright Cecilia raising the wonder higher when to her organ vocal breath was given. And it's a Marty this time.
So to, so to finish with a, a one solitary excursion to France. <laughs> um, and this is a pair of nested pieces by the gamba player known as Damashi, or sometimes the Sieur Damashi. Um, it's a piece with a double. Now, often double is talked about as being a variation, but I don't see that anymore as I see these two strands as variations on each other. Let's just think about this. These instruments were on the maker's bench pretty much close to the same time. They may even share wood. They each refer to you know, um, a shared model. One of them is almost a centimeter longer than the other. That's this one. Um, they're not variants, they're, they're, they're Stradivarius is working to a model, if you like. And the same way with such as when Bach writes a double, it's as if he's got an idea in his mind and he's finding another way through it. So these two movements, I could play them the other way around. I don't like thinking of those variations and that's a kind of good place to finish. We've heard three different approaches to the violin from the Amati family and from Stradivarius in two different moods and in two different historical readings of his instruments. And that seems to be very close to what composers do. So this, when I put one of these violins down, will be Dimash's um, uh, Courant and Double from his uh, Pièce de Vienne. 